Okay. So I've broken this into, as I said, three, three general areas. We'll do the cinematic issues first. Uh, I'd like to just show, show that slide. We can go back to it at the end if you'd li like to have that as part of our discussion. But these are things that came up in my mind when I saw that. Um, one is, you know, is this supposed to be entertainment or is this supposed to be information? Another is, what are the objectives of the filmmakers? What was the point uh, of doing this? What, are they, what message are they trying to get across? Um, I struggled a little bit with conflicting messages, but maybe that's the point of being a Swiss filmmaker. Um, what are the responsibilities uh, that the filmmakers have to show scientific issues accurately? Uh, is that an important part of being a filmmaker for something that purports to be a scientific movie? Or is it more about the storytelling that's involved? What are the responsibilities of the filmmakers to be fair to the people that are in it? Are they objects to be manipulated for the purpose of getting to the objective of the filmmaker? Or is part of what's going on in this movie the idea of treating these people as uh, sympathetic characters? And the last item I've got is, what are the responsibilities to native peoples and their cultures? Because this is a lot about a set of native people that have been abused by their national government for many, many decades, and the struggles that they have in their local environment. This is about the Yakut uh, people in northern Siberia. Okay, so we're going to go to the scientific issues because I feel much more comfortable about that. Is that okay? So I picked out a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting stuff that I like. Um, how moldable are species is kind of what we're talking about here. And the word that we often use is plastic. So plastic in the old-fashioned sense of silly putty or clay. How can we manipulate and move species around? And how moldable are they? What's the inherent moldability uh, of something that we call a species? Um, and Another scientific question is, what, what are the differences between what we'd call traditional genetics, things that have been available to people for the past five, six hundred years as our knowledge of genetics, and what I'm going to call 21st century technologies, which are kind of highlighted in this movie are some of the more recent technologies that are available, things like cloning and large-scale DNA sequencing. And then what constitutes scientific value? Is all science equivalent? How do scientists make rankings? How do we prioritize? How do we think about the scientific issues that we have? And how as a community do we structure our endeavors to move forward in science, giving this value to its essentially abstract information in many ways? And is not all knowledge equal in value? It's something that's brought up, I think, by, by this movie. How are we doing? So, so okay so far? Okay. So, the first thing is how moldable are species? And so I picked out an example I think is familiar and refers back in part to this movie. And that's this. This is a dog. Uh, it is called an Africanus breed. Uh, I think the South African uh, dog breeders needed a cute name uh, for basically the dogs that you find in villages in South Africa. This is an Australian dingo. Uh, it arrived uh, in Australia with the Aboriginal peoples. Uh, the dogs that they ca keep are very similar to these. These are probably what are known as a feral uh, group of species, group of animals that now live in the wild in Australia, quite far from South Africa. This is a Canaan dog. Uh, this is uh, a village dog from uh, parts of the, 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 the Palestinian areas uh, of Israel. This is an Indian village dog. You're starting to see a pattern. Uh, this is a dog photograph that I found from a Cuban village. And this is what's called a USA Carolina dog. And again, this is putting a, a label on something that uh, the folks in the town that I grew up in would just call an old yellow dog. Uh, and so this has uh, been shown by uh, DNA analysis to not be a European-derived dog. Uh, this is uh, still fairly common in rural areas uh, in the south in particular, in the Carolinas, the eastern uh, seaboard of the south. And it is almost certainly derived from North American, Native American uh, dog stock uh, that was transferred from Native American peoples to some of the earlier settlers uh, in the United, uh, that would, be, would become the United States and is not derived primarily from European stocks. So the pattern I'm gonna sh that I'm just trying to show you here is what is a dog? This is a dog. 
So I could have shown you a wolf, but actually wolves were domesticated and turned into this about 30,000 years ago, maybe 20,000 years ago. And for much of human history that we've been interacting with domesticated dogs, this is pretty much what they all look like. There's some variations in color that you can see, but pretty much this is your plain old dog. So beginning with this as our stock material, what can we do? So here's old yellow. And of course, you've seen all these animals before if you watch the Westminster Dog Show. We have a Sharpe. This is an Irish wolfhound next to a miniature pony, uh, showing the size of both of them. This is a Dalmatian, which is actually quite an ancient breed, probably about 3,000 years old. This is a, oops, sorry. This is a uh, Chinese crested hairless dog. A uh, Commodore, I do not know anything about this dog, but uh, we're gonna get back to our ability to understand the length of fur uh, in mammals, which will be important for talking about mammoths. This is uh, a uh, Sky Terrier, again, long hair, uh, an Afghan, a classic long-haired uh, animal, and an English bulldog whose skull uh, is uh, horribly deformed relative to the plain old, old yellow dog over there, uh, and it tells us that the ability to construct the structure of the skull is highly malleable in mammalian species, and it's a great example of that. So, they're pretty, they're pretty malleable. You take, you take a yellow dog and you lean on it real hard, as we say. You go through a set of uh, uh, um, breeding programs and you can imagine that almost anything that you want to think of as an output for a dog can be generated. Okay, so I have another example here. This is not a dog. These are two Tyrolean sheep lambs. This is a Bedlington Terrier. And the deliberate idea behind a Bedlington Terrier was between cutting its fur in a particular way and breeding it in a particular way, can you make a dog that kind of sort of looks like a lamb? And sure enough, you can. I'm pretty sure if you talk to this dog, it does not think it's a lamb. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the dog, if presented, presented with a lamb, would not imagine that it's another member of its own species. So simply looking like a lamb does not mean it is a lamb. Human breeders, typically in this strategy, make a mental image of an end goal and then selectively retain and breed animals that approach that image. And it shows you that the genome, the variation that exists in a set of animals that looks like old yeller, can with determination and breeding in a very conventional, traditional sense, over the course of about 20 or 30 generations, can produce the mental image of the breeder at the end result. So as I said, approximately 30 generations are typically required for the artificial traditional methods of selection to produce rather striking physical or behavioral differences in most mammalian animals. And this, the dog is just a good representative of that. But just to make sure that we're not just talking about dogs, I thought I'd throw another example in. This is a sheep. This is not a sheep. This is a pig. This is a mangalista pig. And even though it looks like a sheep, if you talk to it, it will not tell you that it is a sheep. So, uh, species of many types, not just dogs, many mammalian species have existing variations that are in already existing in their population, in the DNA of their population, that can be chosen and award reproductive success, in this case, to get to this pig, and it can be described as human or artificial selection, a particular phenotype, physiological values that are of interest. Uh, new mutations also appear regularly, so we have a pretty good idea of the frequency with which mutations arise, and many of those mutations are repeated in different animal species. So we have mice that look like Dalmatians, we have mice that look like yellow dogs, we have cats that have spots, so we have the same kinds of mutations with slight variations that you see in a particular mammalian species can be expected to be produced in other mammalian species if you look for them and you breed enough members of that species. So I think that the output here is that typically mammalian species are highly malleable. They're moldable, they're plastic. 
that if we have the tools and the opportunity to simply take them and breed them, we can use the existing genetic variation in a population, plus the expected mutations that will occur during the breeding of that animal to push them into particular directions that we see for uh, human desires. How malleable are things, how moldable are things under natural selection? So this is a, a, a diagram of uh, fossil elephant types that have been identified in the fossil record, as well as two of the, the three existing species of ele elephants. Uh, we have the uh, Indian elephant and the African elephant. That's the Indian elephant right there. And there's the mammoth. And they diverged about a million years ago. So approximately one million years ago, natural selection from a single ancestral population, the yellow dog equivalent, of elephants, under natural selection, pushing apart in two different environments, uh, two species of elephants were able to arise from a common ancestor. The two species adapted to very different climates and two very different environments. So over and over again, over a million years, so tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of generations, that the same underlying genetic pool of information can push a species into two different places and be adapted to two different environments. And that's relatively unsurprising for a geneticist. There are about three million differences that have accumulated in the DNA sequence between an, Afri between an Asian elephant and mammoth DNA because mammoth uh, tissues have been pretty well frozen uh, we're able to extract DNA from them. The DNA is extremely imperfect. It is broken up into really small pieces, but it's still fairly intact in small pieces, and we can take that information, and we can sequence it, and we can compare it to the existing Asian elephant DNA, and we can actually measure the number of differences between them. So we're talking about approximately 3 million differences that have occurred that give us the distinction between Asian elephants and mammoths. Pretty well known. How much information is necessary to change an Asian elephant into a mammoth then? Well, it's a little bit more complicated because there's actually three billion letters or pieces of information in the typical mammal genome. We're not all that different from other mammals that are out there. We have about the same amount of information required to make any of us, to make a rat, to make a mouse, to make a cat, to make a dog, to make a person, to make a mammoth, to make an Asian elephant. is about the same amount of information. It's about three billion pieces of information. About 0.1% of all that information is specific to either the Asian elephant or to the mammoth. So that's about 3 million differences that define what a mammoth is. But we also estimate that even in the process of doing this DNA sequencing, about 0.1% of the data is actually missing. And that doesn't seem like a very large amount. 0.1% seems like a tiny fraction of the data that's missing. But that's also another 3 million pieces of information that we simply do not know what it is. And we estimate there's about a 0.1% sequencing error rate when we do this process for ancient DNA, because ancient DNA is, does not have high quality. So therefore, there are about 3, 000, 3 million letters that are just plain old wrong. So approximately 6 million errors plus missing information is what we think of when we try to compare what's a true difference between the Asian elephant and a mammoth, and what are the differences that we see in the sequence that's available to us. They don't tell you about this ugliness. So, about, oh, so, so how do we identify, out of all this, the millions, or hundreds of thousands at least, functional changes that in the present, that we see in this DNA sequence, in the presence of a large amount of just plain old errors and mistakes and missing information. So the challenge is actually quite large. So, we do not know which of the known differences, the three, billion that we, the three million that we do know. We do not know whether the errors make a difference, and we do not know whether the missing data has an impact that are critical to being a mammoth relative to being an Asian elephant. We don't know what the genes are that are, we, so we, sorry, we do know what the genes are that are likely to be involved in some very simple basic traits because we've seen the same genes being observed in other domesticated animals that we've bred. So, Cats and dogs and guinea pigs, we know what the genes are that are involved in long hair and hair density. It's a handful. We also have a pretty good idea about some of the genes that are involved in skull morphology 
and the size of their bodies. And as you saw from the dogs that I showed you, there's a wide range of dog bodies. We can identify what the kinds of genes are that are involved in the growth of the body and the shape of the skull. So, we're talking about a few dozen changes. So, after a few dozen changes that need to be made in the Indian elephant genome, right, we can probably produce an Asian elephant that has really long hair. And then the real question, the real difficult part of the process that they're talking about doing is, how do we have a test? How do we have an assay? How do we have a measurement tool for understanding which one of the one to three million DNA variations that we see in the DNA sequence are actually the ones that are critical to becoming a mammoth? And not just talking about it looks like a mammoth, but it knows how to live in the tundra. It knows which kind of food to eat, what time to migrate, how to interact with other mammoths and other animals. So there's a variety of things that have evolved over that million years that distinguish the way an Indian elephant interacts with its environment relative to the way that a mammoth would have to interact with its environment correctly. And we don't know what those things are. And I cannot imagine a ready, easy assay that can be reproduced several hundred thousand times to just find out which ones of those changes are. Or which one of these three million pieces of DNA information are simply the result of sequencing error. And then finally, the real problem, the thing that challenges me every day when I go to work, is what are the interactions among these? Because it's not just a series of single changes that lead to an outcome. Everyone who has bred animals knows that those things are interacting that one variation in one gene is not simply linear and additive to another variation in another gene, those things are interacting to produce a result. So it's a little bit more complicated than you would think. How am I doing? Any questions on that part? Was that fairly interesting? Okay. People like dogs? Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick thing on traditional versus 21st century genetics. Have I touched on some of the things that you thought about while you were watching the movie? Okay. So okay. are you yep. basically saying that it's actually really, it's really hard to clone a woolly mammoth to make it not just look like a woolly mammoth, but actually just be a woolly mammoth? Right. Exactly. So the question is, am I saying, is it really, really hard to not just make something that looks like a woolly mammoth, Right? Because that Mangalista pig sure looks like a sheep. Microphone, right? please. Sorry. I'm used to talking to medical students, and I have to get close to them and yell at them. Um, <clears throat> sorry. hope there's no... Uh, uh, anyway. Um, so, uh, something that looks like a woolly mammoth doesn't have all of the attributes of what it would be necessary to be a woolly mammoth in the wild. In the same way that the Mangalista pig is not a sheep, and the Bedlington Terrier is not a lamb, right? Just looking like it is not sufficient to change what an animal is. Okay, what fun one is. Okay, so traditional breeding-based manipulation uses existing variation. Although you looked at those dogs, they all kind of look like yellow dogs. There actually is a lot of variation among them. Most of that information is what we call cryptic or hidden. It's recessive genes that unless they're taken and put in a different context, or two recessive genes are put into the same animal, we do not see the outcome of them. So although there's relative uniformity in the set of yellow dogs that I showed, there's actually a vast amount, a pool of fantastic variation that exists among all the dogs on the planet. And what we can do is we can pull those pieces of variation out and put them together in new ways to see the results that we've seen in the different breeds of animals that we've got. So traditional breeding is based on manipulation of that existing variation in a population. And it's done simply by mating parents with measurable characteristics. Right? So you see animals and you say, I'd like to enhance the characteristics that I'm seeing in these animals. I'll breed them together, take a look at a large number of progeny, and continue that process. So, and this has been done for about 2,000 to 3,000 years, that people have been taking domesticated animals and changing them into something specific that they'd like to see as an outcome from them, whether it's for economic value or for appearance or for behavioral traits. So the key here is that large numbers of progeny need to be generated. Tens of thousands or thousands of individuals need to be generated to produce this and measured. From those, a small number of new parents are chosen. 
What the dog breeders don't tell you is the number of dogs that are not chosen to go into the next generation. The majority of progeny are typically sterilized, not allowed to breed, or simply killed. That's the bad part about selection. New variants we know will appear at random in any breeding population like this. They will be at a low but fairly consistent rate. And as those variations appear and we see them, these new mutations, these new changes, they can then be entered into the breeding program to, go, to drive it in a particular direction. One of the ones that was commonly what was seen quite often in, in, in dogs were dogs with little short legs. And so those mutations could then be bred into a variety of other breeds of dogs to produce the equivalent type of dog, but with really short legs. Okay. Um, after 20 to 50 generations, depending on how it's done, it's required to combine the many genes into a defined breed that the breeder has in their imagination that they'd like to target for this. So that's a traditional way of doing things. Uh, the other part here is hundreds to tens of thousands of female parents are required to do this in a traditional way. All right, so there are new technologies. One of them which you may have heard about is called CRISPR. Uh, CRISPR is a way of using the DNA sequence that we have and then manipulating it in the laboratory and putting that DNA back into cells to specifically change them in some way that we know uh, about ahead of time. It works quite well in cells, which is quite remarkable. Uh, changes can be targeted to a single specific letter among all of the three billion letters in the genome. So it's got high specificity. Each change is performed in the laboratory. It can happen in the matter of weeks. So the speed and the accuracy, the precision at which we can make some of these changes has dramatically changed over the past dozen years. So it's a high selectivity, high specificity, and rapid results in cells in the laboratory. CRISPR can also be used to work in eggs and in stem cells that can then be grown into tissues or different kinds of cells and sometimes even into full animals. This takes longer, months to years. But so we can go in to a cell, we can change a specific single letter of the code and then turn that into a full animal. This has been done many times in the mouse where we have a lot of control of the system in the laboratory. So rather than waiting now, for a spontaneous mutation to occur, which we're going to guess is going to happen at some point in time, CRISPR directs mutations that are known changes to known genes. So I can find the gene for making a long-haired mouse, find out what the letter changes that allowed that mouse to have long hair that was a spontaneous mutation. I can find the equivalent gene in another genome, pig, elephant, whatever, and make that same change into it, and I've got a high probability that that change will also give rise to an animal that has long hair. The negative and drawback of this is that unknown and uncharacterized genes that do things that we don't know about cannot be targeted by the CRISPR strategy. I must know ahead of time what the gene is and what the change is. So until I know what those thousands or tens of thousands or millions of DNA base pair changes that are necessary to make a mammoth relative to an Indian elephant, I cannot use these technologies. I can only use these technologies on the genes for which I have some idea about knowing what they can do. People get that? Okay. That's my mage story. Okay. Then the logistics of doing this? Um, all methods require a female animal bearing a full-term offspring. I hate to be a downer. Uh, progeny that are errors are typically discarded. You did not see that in the uh, puppies that were being cloned, but any puppies that don't have the right look to them are discarded. Combining of variations requires a female animal. So if I make a single a set of animals that have a single change in a single location to them, those are not being combined yet into a complex combination of those until I breed them together, typically. Combining variations, and this is my comment that I have about what keeps me up at night and what keeps me going into work every day, is that the combining of variations produces nonlinear results. It's not just I keep adding things to it and I get the next thing in, in the line. Adding changes to a complex system now leads to very dramatic changes that were not expected. 
And so then we get to the final point, really, which is when is something going from really, really hard to impossible? And you'll have to decide on when that decision is. And what resources need to be expended in such an effort? And could those resources, the same resources, the same DNA sequencing, the same genetic manipulation, exactly the same tools be used in a different project? So the same amount of money, the same amount of human effort, the same amount of skill sets, the same amount of brain power that is used to do a particular task, how can it be applied and could it be applied to something else that has more value and be used more effectively in another way? And so my last statement here is that prioritization is not a sidelight of scientific research. Prioritization of our tasks is essential to what we do every day. And it's on the borderline, and this is my transition, between science issues and ethical issues. Because it's a practical issue about how we use our resources, but it's also an ethical issue about how we make our priorities. Okay. So I'm just going to do a quick thing now. This is the website that I found for reviveandrestore.org from George Church's group. It starts out with a picture of a bunch of uh, mammoths. But what it says right on the first page, and I give George Church a little bit of credit for putting this right on the first page, is the intent is not to make perfect copies of extinct woolly mammoths, right off the bat, but to focus on the mammoth adaptations needed for Asian elephants to thrive in the cold climate of the Arctic. And I went to the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, and I have a very good friend who was from southern India. And the first time he ever left southern India, he flew direct to, to, um, to Kennedy Airport, changed planes, and then flew direct to Rochester, New York. And it was February. And I don't know if anybody's ever been to the Rochester Airport, but there's just a set of glass doors that open out onto the parking lot. And I'll never forget him telling me that he put every piece of clothing he owned on. That door opened, he got hit with that cold air, and he actually fell on his butt. So I can imagine being an Indian elephant. Uh, and I'm not quite so sure uh, about the, the decision uh, to thrive in a cold climate for an Indian elephant. But that's a personal note. Okay. Anyway, so how do you do this? Uh, this comes right from the website. Sequence the genomes, find the differences, identify mammoth-specific variations, already been done. Make each individual change into a non-stem cell, so nothing that's going to become a mammoth, but just a regular old cell, also easy to do. And then turn the non-stem cells into stem cells, and then put them into embryos. Very difficult to do, but still possible. Implant the embryos into Asian elephants, and go to a term birth. Hasn't been done yet. Extremely difficult to do, presumably. And then the next step that he puts on the website is invent an artificial uterus. Okay, well, you know, that's not impossible, but is that how we want to be investing our, uh, our money? And then make the uterus very big. And then make sure that it can function for 18 to 22 months. And then allow the calves to grow up and then be tested for their mammothness. Repeat. Bring together partial mammoths, repeat, and then this has what we call in my business a major flaw. Um, if you write a grant proposal to NIH, it gets sent to NIH, it gets peer reviewed, it's anonymous peer reviewed, and you get this statement back, you are in trouble. And the statement is called serial optimism, <laughs> right? Not parallel optimism, but serial optimism is necessary here. It is not viewed as a strong research proposal, typically. So that's all I'm going to say about that, George. Uh, anyway, so this is a view of the different kinds of elephants that are out there. There's your African bush elephant, the African forest elephant, uh, Asian elephant, and a mammoth. And so it's pretty much on the regular size, uh, same size as an Asian elephant. Uh, it's approximately 10% larger than an Asian elephant about the same size as an African elephant. They consume about 150 kilograms of plant matter per day, so you've got to figure out how to feed the animals. And um, are they moldable by human selection? I wanted to show this picture because it's, it shows a baby mammoth with its mom. And elephants are highly social animals, and actually quite intelligent. And so 
we're not just talking about abstract concepts here. We're talking about real animals that really interact with each other and have a social structure and have long lives and have memories. After a female gives birth, she does not breed again until the calf is weaned with a four to five year interval between births. Captive Asian elephant populations are not self-sustaining. In other words, the captive elephant populations that you see in zoos now continue to require captured elephants from the wild to be brought in. That the breeding programs that they already have in zoos right now are not sufficient to make up for the number of elephants that die every year. Captive elephants have a first year infant mortality of about 30%. Anyway, so I'll stop there for questions. How'd I do? Great. Okay. <clears throat> what would you guys like to discuss? Let's talk about the ethics. Shall we, shall we talk about ethics? Okay, shall I move forward? I've only got a couple more slides. All right. Uh, what's a scientific value? How do we decide? Uh, can we blah, blah, blah. There's a balance of novelty versus husbanding of our limited resources, which I think is about how we set priorities in science. And typically it's based on community discussions between scientists and non-scientists and critical anonymous peer review. So there we go. Ethical issues. Okay. So how do we assess and prioritize the value of different types of animals? What are the values to us? Why is it that... We don't eat horses, right? Some we. Some we. <laughs> we, may we. But why don't we eat horses? What is that, right? Why do we eat pigs? And why is it no longer considered a nice thing to have dog fights when that was a perfectly respectable form of entertainment 400 or 500 years ago? How do we make these decisions about the value of animals to us and what they are, what their objects are. Are animals things over which humans have complete mastery? Or do individual animals have inherent rights? And to what level do they have these rights? You'll notice these are all questions. I have no answers. Is there a spectrum of rights? Right. If a pig is brought up as a family pet, is it different from a pig that's brought up to be killed for food? I personally have worked with tens of thousands of mice in my career. I have never enjoyed the process of killing them. But I have a mental image of why I have them. They're not random mice, they're not mice in the wild, and they're there for a specific purpose and they're treated in a specific way with lots of regulatory control. Is that okay? Or is it something that I've just managed to negotiate within myself? And is an Asian elephant with a thick, long hair a mammoth, like George Church would have you believe? And in a social species like mammoths and dogs, is it cruel to use a surrogate mother to generate an animal from another species? Um, what are the areas of mastery that are appropriate? So I can go back, actually, if we... Oh, this is my, the one that I really focused on, is entertainment a socially acceptable area where individual humans are allowed mastery over animals? Has anyone seen the, the documentary-ish film Blackfish? Right. At what point are animals not appropriate for entertainment? We don't do bull baiting, we don't do bear baiting, we don't do cock fights, we don't do dog fights. Right? Those are animals for entertainment. And yet, we still have animals that we breed for racing around a greyhound track. Right? Animals that are bred for racing in horse races. Animals that are bred for people to have in their homes as pets. Is it a spectrum of things that are available? And do we have mastery over them in any of those contexts? And society already has laws to regulate cruelty, deliberate cruelty to animals. Is it appropriate for society to regulate animals for other forms of entertainment other than cruelty-based entertainment? And does the method of genetic change matter? Or is it the end result of genetic change that matters? I use traditional breeding to make 
a mammoth-like elephant? Is that different from me using a CRISPR-derived stem cell to generate a mammoth-like elephant? So, those are my questions to you. Uh, how did I do? Was that sufficient for our entertainment value? Yes? Hi. Good to see Hi. You. I can't see anything. I've got this light right in me. I'm assuming you're a good friend of mine. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that always sees you walking your dog. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I was particularly taken uh, aback a bit where the guy at, was it DGI? Was essentially very simply stating that we will get to the point, this is what I heard. Yes. We will get to the point where we will be able to have genome uh, total knowledge of every species on the planet. And then we will be able to create any kind of human or other organism we desire with particular uh, phenotype and genome. Right. And so I think in part you mis I think in part you misheard really what they were saying. Yeah. And I, I and I lay the, the onus of that on our filmmakers. Um, the idea of being able to read something is not the same as being able to write it. And he talks about that quite a bit. The, because I know the letters doesn't mean I understand them. Right. If, I'm, if I'm given uh, a book in Yakut, I would not be able to read it. Even though I could recognize every letter in it, I would not be able to understand what it means. And I, even if I knew the words, because I'm not part of the culture, I don't truly understand what it means to the, to, to the people who have that as their culture who are reading it. So in the same way, simply having the sequence information, yes, it's a first step for doing a lot of things, but in and of itself does not get us there. Right. Um, I think that the filmmakers were quite unfair to, and they played on some negative stereotypes uh, of our colleagues in China. Um, there were lines in there that I found very disturbing. Uh, why, are, why are these things included? And then I actually played back over and over again one part where that man was talking, where he says something about God's word is imperfect. Did everybody see that? How many of you listened to what he said, and how many of you read the subtitles? He actually said, I believe, and it's difficult because he definitely does not have English as a first language. I believe he said God's world is imperfect, not God's word is imperfect. And what he means, I think, by that is that human beings have driven organisms to extinction. God's world is this imaginary place before people did that. And is it possible to get back to a place where all of the species that we have driven to extinction are able to live again? Now, I don't know if that's what he meant, but it could have been that, and the filmmaker never gave him an opportunity to clarify. I spend a lot of my time with people who don't have English as a first language, <clears throat> and if I'm confused by something they say, I am obligated to ask them, did you really mean to say that in English? Or did you mean to say something else? And that filmmaker did not do that. Did I now go off on a tangent as well as answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's more to it in terms of uh, where I can extrapolate to the point, whether it's in a year, 20 years, 100 years, where something like what my imagination for uh, <clears throat> Might be possible. Yep. The other thing, you, you said there was nothing in the film about human genetics, and yet the woman that was doing the tour uh, definitely talked about the eradication of Down syndrome babies. Uh, she did not say that. She said that with genetic information, we can make sure there are no Down syndrome babies. Right? And so already what's being done is that there are pre-implantation diagnoses that are being done with fertilized eggs so that those can be identified. Now you can, you can question about whether a fertilized egg is a human being or not, and we're not going to get into that discussion. But clearly at the earliest stage, we can identify what the DNA is in a fertilized egg right after the first couple of cell divisions. 
and extract a cell from that, sequence that, and see whether it has Down syndrome or not. Now, that would never then be implanted back into a woman. And you can have a discussion, if you'd like, about what the ethics of that are. But I think, in a very formal sense, it's very different than saying we're going to terminate the pregnancies of babies that have Down syndrome. Does that kind of make sense? And I believe a lot of the sequencing that they're doing is this pre-implantation sequencing diagnosis, but I'm not completely sure. So you make the point that there are uh, relatively few dif uh, genetic differences between species and uh, between in, in individuals in the same species, yet there are tremendous differences between individuals. And we don't really understand the basis for that yet. But it's very clear, I think it's clear, that what's happening is that there's a lot of networks that are generated from uh, information networks that are go beyond the DNA. Yes. Right? Is that true? That is correct. Um, the mass can, can people hear okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat your, okay. your questions then. So the question is this, I, and this is what disturbs me. This mass accumulation of genetic data about individuals uh, is right now a mess, right? It's hard to interpret. Right. But it's not hard to imagine in the future that we will be able to build on that information, uh, we'll be able to make insights about the networks and be able to generate a much better understanding and prediction from the genetic data. Am I yes. correct about that? You're absolutely correct, right? Can you comment a little bit about the feasibility that this, that we're just at the beginning of this stage of understanding the information. Are we, is there grounds to be fearful that this could be uh, misused in the future? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. there is grounds to be fearful. Uh, and what you're hoping is that the people doing this research as part of their training, as part of the way that they think every day, are thinking about the ethics of what they're working on. And I believe at least here, we do that with our students. Uh, I hope that in many places they do that with their students. At the very least, we need to have many people outside of the field uh, watching, observing, asking these questions. And it's why I'm here. But what I'm really asking, though, is really a question. I'm not trying to make a statement. And that is, do you see... Um, progress, how far away are we from actually understanding functionally what these genetic differences amount to? Um, we are very far away in some very complex outcomes. Um, things like height, body weight, intelligence. We are very far away from understanding those. Those are extremely complex interaction, interactions of hundreds of variants in hundreds of genes in a nonlinear way. We already know that. Um, that if we look for how many genes impact some of these outcomes that are in the hundreds, even something like high blood pressure or kidney disease. So I think it is vastly more complex than most people understand. There are some things that are not very complex or some things are actually quite simple. And most of those, it ends up that they're simple on first observation, but as we go deeper, we find that they are also having a large amount of complexity. Um, so I think we should be aware of it. I think it's going to be a relatively slow and difficult process. It's not going to be quick. My optimism uh, is tempered by seeing what human beings have done and continue to do with the animals that we believe that we have mastery over. Right. I don't want to offend anybody that has a purebred dog, um, but many of the purebred dogs uh, are maintained in ways that are not healthy for those breeds. And until we gain control over how we view those animals, I think we're not going to have a, a strong discussion about how we're going to be talking about human beings when, when we get to the point where we control them as well. I think we can do that, though. I think some of, these, some of these breeds just need to be dealt with in a more genetically appreciated way, and they can be maintained quite safely. Yeah. My biggest fear as one of the youngest people in this room, no offense everybody, um, is that uh, with um, 
uh, other countries uh, developing this technology faster than us because of Western ethical concerns, we're going to get left in the dust in the future, and uh, like China is going to corner the market on this kind of technology, this kind of research, and they will have information that we do not have, and that will that will be where we're in trouble. They will be able to do things and understand things that we do not because we stopped our research because of ethical concerns. Um, I, I think, did people hear that, about the concern about, about relative ethical uh, uh, value systems? Um, uh, I think that's something to be very aware of. Um, from what I've seen from my colleagues, they clearly understand the ethical challenges regardless of what culture they've come from. Um, I think there are always people who are on the ends of the distribution of that, both in the conservative way and in a pushing way, uh, a novelty generating way. Um, science gives rewards to some level to this novelty, but it also uh, pushes back from that. Um, so I, I think we should be, again, continually aware of it. Most of the technologies that we're talking about really are not highly technically complex, which is kind of surprising. I mean, you saw the photograph of them putting a nucleus into an egg. Um, you can't do that at home, but you can almost do it at home. Um, it's really just a microscope and a little glass. If you see people doing this, some people still do it with mouth pipettes, believe it or not. So there's a hose coming out of the person's mouth, and they're kind of moving their tongue back and forth and pushing the air in and out. And you're going, well, that's pretty easy. I could do that. Um, so I think... Uh, those sequencers that you've seen, uh, those are very high technology, um, and so those are going to be a challenge. But I think a lot of the other technologies that we're talking about are relatively straightforward and can be done uh, relatively easily in a lot of locations. So I'm not hugely concerned, but I do think it's important to be aware. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, way, uh, there's somebody waving way back there that I can't see, which is you, I think. Okay. Um, you know, I, in science, I think, and then there are other people here that, that do science, I think your reputation is a huge part of how you're treated. Uh, and so I don't think the general scientific community views this guy very seriously. Um, he's clearly smart. He knows what he's doing. He's able to form a company that's able to be successful in cloning dogs for people. Um, but if he produced some new information uh, that needed to be replicated in other locations to be confirmed, I've got a feeling that people are really not going to view it very favorably. They're going to not waste their time trying to confirm his results. Um, and a single individual with a result is not science. Right? It has to be replicated for it to be science. At least that's my opinion. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, what are the fears of uh, possible mutations uh, further down the line, unintended consequences, so to say, of... Uh, editing genomes, like uh, mutations generations down the line? Um, as far as mutations that are what we call germline, so ones that can be passed on from generation to generation, um, the mechanics, the system that your cells have for preserving your information intact is actually quite strong. So I think it's going to be very challenging to do something in an unintended way that leads to a higher frequency of mutations in the germline. Uh, that may not be the same, though, as the mutations that occur what we call the soma or the body. Mutations that occur in the body tend to lead to things like cancer. Uh, so I'm probably more concerned about unintended consequences that lead to higher uh, frequencies of cancer in people than to germline mutations that then will give rise to offspring that have a higher rate of change. Did that kind of answer it? I was thinking more of like uh, changing, like uh, let's say somebody changed something to make someone HIV uh, resistance and then generations down the line, that uh, group of people who have that lose or yes. gain or 
have something unintended because of uh, interaction between uh, I think that's a very valid concern, right? Um, the sentence that I put up about how interactions of genetic variations are nonlinear exactly gets to that point. We may think that we know that changing this will lead to that, but we do not know how it's going to interact with all the other changes that are out there, right? And you know, we don't know what those interactions are going to be, and some of them are going to be multiple things interacting. So it is a it should be a concern. For malicious purposes? Or something like unintendedly uh, without regulations. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was a news story about a scientist, I don't know if it was confirmed or not, in uh, China, saying he did this thing with children, making them like, HIV resistant. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if that was confirmed or not, but how would the scientific community prevent, like, a lone scientists or lone people from uh, doing unregulated work like that? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, and that's really the discussion people should be having. I think the control of that lies in everyone's hands, not just in the scientists. The scientists can be good observers, can be watching, can be monitoring, uh, can understand what's going on. But the decision of acting upon that information, I think, belongs to the whole society, which I think has sort of happened in that case. That person's sort of been stripped of their laboratory, they've been put on you know, some sort of probation, and there's a lot of issues that are going right now about what do you do with this individual. Uh, that's a big warning to anyone else who's thinking of, of doing the same sort of thing. There's one more back here, yes? Yeah, I have a question about the life insurance companies requesting genetic information. Uh -huh. So you talked about hundreds of variables of nonlinearity. Is there any way that we Um, I believe that what we will continue to, what we are seeing, what we continue to see is that genetic information of the individual belongs to the individual and they should have control over that. Um, so that you would not be giving that information to anybody that, any company that you think would be using it in, a, in, in, a, in an inappropriate way. Um, there would also be, I'm assuming in the future, controls over how this can be done and, and be used. But again, um, Right now, we do not have any idea how that works. Uh, so although there are some patterns for um, lifespan, how long you live relative to genetic variation, um, each one of those that's been identified has a tiny impact on the overall lifespan of an individual. And it is almost entirely swamped out by environmental variation that we see, in other words, we can see a genetic variation. I can say, wow, you know, on average, people with that variation live 15 days longer, right, than everybody else. And then you go back out and smoke the three packs of cigarettes a day. It's like, eh, well, maybe that's not going to do the trick. Uh, so I think it's this combination of genes and environment, and many of the impacts are very small that we're seeing so far. So just a quick follow-up yep. on the ethics of denying an applicant a policy if they refuse to provide you with their genetic Um, uh, I believe it's illegal uh, as of right now. I believe that there, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that there is a law in place now that says that you cannot be denied insurance based on DNA uh, information. Um, based on the, the failure to provide it or based on what uh, DNA information? It may, I don't know if it's on the failure to provide it, but it's definitely on the information. I'll have, I'll, I'll have to look that up. Yep. Going off that machine learning question, yep. um, you know, you, you talk a lot about how you can kind of brute force uh, approach to, to genetics and, you know, force variations over, you know, 30 generations. Uh, how much currently are we using computers to kind of artificially brute force genetic improvements? And do you see the, the industry going there in the future? Uh, it's already happening. Um, it's typical, and it's, well, Non-computer based versions of that, so the algorithms for that are probably 80 years old. 
so um, cattle breeding, um, corn breeding, a lot of agricultural products. Many geneticists uh, have been trained in, and do research on what are the algorithms that we need for optimizing the strategies for breeding. So we have those already as far as agricultural uh, organisms and crops are, are concerned. Um, I think that if we had breeding programs and total control of breeding processes for any species, those same algorithms would hold. I doubt very much that we would have that for human beings, right? So it's about the breeding control more than the algorithms that are necessary. And those continue to get better. So with the, with the ability to use computers to generate some of the algorithms, we can do a better job than just the old fashioned you know, hand, hand equations. We have time for one more question. I'm gonna go, who has not asked a question yet that is interested in one? I can't see anyone. Way back there, I'm assuming you got your hand up. That, that's a fantastic question. Um, mostly I shake my head. Um, the uh, non-scientists are given information that is gleaned from the scientific literature to be interesting for them. What they are seeing is, uh, imagine, you know, Captain Cook heading across the Pacific to explore the Pacific, they're being told where the islands are. And they're not being introduced to the vast distances of total ignorance that a typical scientist is faced with. We don't know where the next island is and we look out over the front of the ship and all we see is endless, endless ignorance. Um, and so uh, if you don't do it, you don't see it. Uh, but uh, there are very few islands of knowledge out there in the vast sea of ignorance, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about, right? You only hear back about the good days where somebody finds a really cool new island with palm trees. Um, did I kind of yeah. answer the question? Yeah. Um, yes, so we wallow in our ignorance. Um, I do, at least. Okay. Well done. Well done.